Well, we are less than a week away from the election, which makes me very happy. Um, and maybe makes a lot of people on this couch happy. Um, I feel like we're at the point right now where it's a little bit before Christmas, and the presents are under the tree, and I spend a whole lot of my day shaking those presents with bows on them, saying things like Iowa Senate and Colorado governor, wondering what's inside. Um, but I'm going to take us a little bit away from the present piece of this and what's going to happen on Wednesday and look sort of a little bit beyond that as well. Um, and I know we talk a lot or we hear a lot about these numbers getting thrown around, uh, prognosticators talking about these models that they have, that there's a 68% or a 62% chance or a 73% chance of the Senate taking over. The first question I want to throw out to you all is, is a different number, and that's the number of 68%, um, and that's the percentage of people who said that they're paying attention to this election, which is down 10 points from 2010. It's down even further from where we were in 2006, that people say they're just not keyed into this election. And fewer people now than in the last two midterm elections say they're going to vote. So maybe we can start this way. But I have my theories about why people aren't engaged in this election, but I'm curious what you think about it and why that's happening and what it tells us about both this election and what to expect going forward. Well, Amy, I think it's... Uh largely a result of cynicism in the electorate. Yes. Uh, as you indicated, you always have lower turnout in, in midterm elections, but the fact that you have even fewer people engaged than in normal midterm, midterm elections, I think, is a function of the fact they look at Washington, D.C., they look at the Congress, uh, and they see nothing getting done. And a lot of them are concluding that it doesn't make a difference. Uh, you're especially seeing this among independent voters. Uh, where the intensity of independent voters or the likelihood of vote of independent voters has dropped significantly from previous yep. midterm elections. Yep. And those are the voters that are hoping for, you know, compromise, hoping for solution. I think all voters are hoping for solution, but they're the, they're the people that are especially turned off uh, as a result of what they see as inaction. And I'm happy to talk more about the causes of inaction in Washington, but I think that's the, that's the, the perception driver. of the inability to get things done has reduced the focus in this midterm election. And, and Governor, you're obviously, uh, you were the chair of the NGA, right, for a year. This was a, two years ago right. that you were, you were the governor. Governors are supposed to be different, right, that, they, that they're not part of this mess in Washington. But are you, is there a sense that the governor's races are different, that there are not as much a referendum on inaction, or is it still frustration going on that, State houses seem to be even more polarized than they've been in the recent past. Well, I think governors are different. I think Senator Manchin would probably agree with that uh, from his own experience. Um, and I think we're different because we're generally, we're not measured so much based on whether we give a great speech or the quality of our rhetoric. We're measured on pretty simple things like are we making our economy better, improving schools and the like. That being said, I think uh, what the congressman said about cynicism is right in the sense that not only are people frustrated that Washington is not getting anything done, I think people feel that more and more their voice doesn't really count, that it's, they're drowned out by the big money, and that the appeals that so many elected officials or candidates make to them have absolutely nothing to do with their own lives, and it has to do with sort of this you know, negative vitriol about the other person. And I think you know, one, one of the big lessons is people are a whole lot more interested in themselves than they are in the candidates. And the question is, what is it that the candidates are going to do to make their lives better? And I think a lot of people would say they're not really hearing anything that's very compelling in that regard. That's right. And you're on the trail all the time. You must hear a lot about this. And, 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 and speak to the point, too, that the fact is a lot of the people who would be the compromisers, the so-called moderates that you're out there campaigning for, well, uh, they're the most vulnerable. Yeah. And if they lose, who's sort of left well, to And John, my good friend John here, you know, we work together a lot. And you have to have people in the middle. And right now, we've got the core of our middle, middle of our uh, party in the, in the Senate is right up for election. And yep. all, everybody's on the bubble right yep. now. So it'll make it much more difficult if they're not successful to try to get anything done, no matter who's in the leadership because you have to have that moderate middle to work with. Uh, I think the people are upset from this standpoint. In West Virginia, when you spend this much money trying to tell us who we should be for and why we should be against somebody, and most of it's negative, why we should be against somebody, they'd like to think, well, if you care that much about my state, why don't you just invest something, do something. Show me you really care. Don't just come in and scorch the earth and thinking. So it's turned a lot of people off thinking that all I'm seeing is negative. Uh, they're saying, I, no human being could be that bad. 
or... Nobody could be as bad. <laughs> and, 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 and I think the people are just fed up with it. And, and also, they, they think it's been taken out of their hands. Right. They have very little to do with the outcome anymore because there's so much money, so much controlled by so few. But, but let me ask you all this, too, and you, I would love for you to weigh in, because we know in 2016, it's the more moderate Republicans that are up in the Senate. So folks from blue states, not just these aren't Democrats defending red states, it's Republicans defending blue states. So is the expectation that we're just going to see the same thing in I'm 2016? Sure that, that Will you go out on the trail and no. say, this person here says they're moderate, but they're really not, they're a terrible person? I, I don't do that. I just I know the ones I work with and the Republicans that I work with. And right now you've got Susan Collins, should get reelected. Uh, you've got uh, basically down in uh, uh, Lindsey Graham, should get reelected. Lamar Alexander should get reelected. I'm a Democrat saying this, and these are good people. You've got to have that certain core. I also think that Mark Be Mark Beggy should get reelected. Mary Landrieu should get reelected. Mark Pryor should get reelected. These are all solid people. And we can work with them. You can at least come to some agreement. And when you lose that ability to just, just to have conversation, I've said this so much. I came, most of us come from an area where you're guilt by uh, association. If somebody did something wrong, they see you talking to them, they think that you must agree with them. This town is guilt by conversation. John and I sometimes couldn't even have a conversation with both sides thinking we might be conspiring. And when you can't have people that are willing to, to say, we're going to talk about these issues, and that's what's really at stake right now, and it's scary. Well, so I know you penned an op-ed the other day talking about what would happen if Republicans took control of Congress, and you seem to be addressing this whole issue, which is we're going to focus on competence and getting something done that the public wants to see done. Um, is that really, truly possible, given the way that these campaigns have been run, first of all, very vitriolic, a lot of negatives, the fact that the middle is more likely than not to be gone, you're going to have really conservative and really liberal. Um, and you have, it seems to be, a culture where one side says, it's our way or the highway, there's no compromise. Well, How can that work? I think it's critical that we get things done. I'm optimistic about the future. Joe and I work closely together on a lot of issues. We serve on the Energy Committee together. We work on issues of, of energy, and I address some of that in the op-ed. Yep. You know, the interesting, you mentioned the 68% number. The other number, Washington Post 68% yesterday, Dan Ball's column, is people think the country is seriously, 68% of Americans believe the country is seriously heading in the wrong direction. And I've been in 17 states with all of our candidates, and that's what I'm hearing all around the country, uh, the concerns that we're heading in the wrong direction, and we need to actually get some things done, and in a bipartisan way, I say let's look at the bills that, in this editorial, let's look at the bills that passed the House with significant numbers of Democrats voting along with Republicans on energy, on changes to the health care law. Uh, on education, on jobs in the economy, the stuff that Penny Brisser is talking about, to get done for the country, to get people back to work, to get put people with more money in their own pockets. But one of the things you mentioned, too, you said Republicans will work to fully repeal Obamacare. So that seems like a non-starter when it comes to the idea that we're going to start with compromise, because that's just an issue that, beyond the fact that you know that the president's not going to go along with that, Democrats aren't going to go along with it, you have 60% of the public that says, we don't want a full repeal. We want fixes, but we don't want a full repeal. So it seems like we're going to start, really, if we start from that premise, I don't know how you're so going to be able to get to that vote, point. There'll be a vote on that, but okay. what we really need what to happens. do is take care of the, the parts of the health care law that have been so damaging. The Secretary of Commerce was out here talking about people's take-home pay. When the president and the health care law define the work week as a 30-hour week, that has hurt so many workers across the country as, as school districts, universities cut their hours to below 30 hours a week. That's cutting into people's paychecks. Uh, this whole employer mandate health care part of the law. I think there over 30 Democrats voted to delay or repeal the employer mandate because they know it's hurting the economy, it's hurting people's ability to, to get back to work. So I'm looking at things that have passed the House with overwhelming bipartisan support and get those to the President's desk. So this guy's in the House. So, so let's, 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 let, me let's just, see what let, let me just say, I, I think the point you, you suggested is absolutely true. How you run a campaign determines in part your ability to govern, whether you're willing to make the compromises necessary. And right now we see a lot of scorched earth campaigns against a lot of moderate Democrats, as Senator Manchin indicated. Uh, and what disturbs me most about the polling data uh, is that uh, if you ask Democrats in polls whether they're interested in compromising to get things done for the country, you have about 60 percent 
who say, yes, we do want a compromise, even if we don't get everything we want. When you ask that same question of Republicans and certainly Tea Party Republicans, you get very different answers, much less interest in compromise. And so that's why you have a lot of candidates who are running on the Republican side who are saying, we're not going to compromise on these issues. So when, in fact, they get elected, if you're going to deliver no compromise, it means you deliver continued stalemate. I mean, the senator raised the issue of bills that have lots of bipartisan support. We have a bipartisan immigration bill passed by the Senate with a big bipartisan vote. We haven't even had a vote on that well, in, the House of, in the House of Representatives. And that's an issue that majorities in the country support. Now, the incoming majority leader in the House, um, Kevin McCarthy, quoted the other day saying, we've got to prove that we can govern. We're going to reach out. It sounds like he has a different approach, much like Senator Barrasso here. Are you optimistic about that? I think he I'm said at one point, he said, we're gonna, we're, so we I, have one muscular united agenda. You're going to bridge both chambers. Curious I, about that. I saw Kevin McCarthy's comments. Yes. I, I welcome mm -hmm. that. Uh, hopefully we Do you can believe that? Them. I believe his intention. The question is whether <laughs> he can deliver that. his intention, given the fact that so many people in his caucus, especially on the Tea Party side, and they're making gains. They're in a number of th in the House. Oh. A number of the current incumbent Republicans That's who are right. already very much on the right are being replaced by people who are even further on the right and more invested in no compromise. So uh, I'm, again, I welcome the intention. Uh, there are lots of things that the public clearly supports moving forward on uh, that we'd like to at least get a vote on in the House. This is well, why I'm glad I, to yeah. be. This is why I'm glad, glad to be a governor. Be a governor. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to, to deal with that. No, and it's not that it's uh, politics is perfect in my state or any other state, but I mean, just you know, to, we can at least get stuff done, and that is exactly what people are looking for, and, and, and it's what they hold us accountable to. But what we're seeing, though, at the state legislative level, at one point it was that Congress may be dysfunctional, but at least at the legislative level, governors would, in most states, have to deal with one body or maybe both that were of a different party. Now you have more one party controlled legislatures than we've seen in certainly in recent history. So tell me though about how that works because I think we're seeing some backlash to that. In fact, we're seeing a lot of states where there is an agenda both on the left and the right that is much more partisan and where we're seeing voters feeling as frustrated with their, their state government as they are with what's happening in Washington. So this is all I've known as governor. Uh, I was elected in 2008, and before I was elected, a Democrat, I'm a Democrat. The Democrats were in the minority in the House, but for the, since I was elected, we've had a majority in, in both chambers. Um, and so that brings with it its own blessings and its own difficulties, for sure. And I think you know, part of what we always have to do is make sure that we're focused on where the people want us to be focused and not to ever over-interpret over any particular mandate. And so most of the things that we have to deal with as a governor are not particularly partisan. Creating you know, more and better jobs, improving schools, make sure we're doing what we ought to do for health care and transportation and the environment. These are not Democratic or, or, or Republican issues. And you know, one of my responsibilities, I think the re responsibility of every governor, is to keep the legislature focused on what actually matters to the people. Well, that's what I was, was going to ask. So how does a governor do that? Because it seems in some of these states, you have Colorado on the Democratic side, North Carolina on the Republican side, where the legislature, new legislature, one party control decided they wanted to push the governor or push the agenda, and the governor seemed to go along with it, and now there's, they're, they're feeling the backlash of yeah. that. So how do you as a governor say to the legislature, I know you guys have the votes, maybe enough votes to override my veto, how do you do that? Well, you use the bully pulpit and you also remind people of history because what happens, these, these things tend to go in cycles. And so I remind the legislature in Delaware as an example, there were two times in the last 40 years when the Democrats had a supermajority in both chambers as well as having the governor's office. And within two years or four years, it was totally reversed. And so and that's happened actually a couple times. And these things, you know, the voters tend to keep us honest over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And I think our job is to make sure we all stay honest and focus on what the people expect in the near term. Let okay. me, let me just say, I, I can speak from both sides. I was the governor of the state of West yep. Virginia from 2004 to 2010, and now coming to the Senate. When I decided to leave early after Bob Byrd died, I thought, well, you know what? I know how it works on this end of it. You, as a leader, you never put the opposing side in a difficult position where you embarrass them or they can't go home and defend themselves. 
They only give you one shot at that. You put them in a situation, you mislead them, and you put them to where they can't go home and defend themselves, they'll never be with you again. So I had super majorities of Democrats in both the House and the State Senate mm -hmm. when I was governor. But I had a group of Republicans that I worked very closely with because I needed them all at times to get some things done. And with that being said, I never would let the Democrats beat up on the Republicans. And another thing, I wouldn't let the Republicans take cheap shots at Democrats because they were super majority. I say, wait a minute, I could control that because I had the budget. They all wanted something. <laughs> so I could say, guys, we're going to play, and we're all going to play as family here. We're going to have a lot of fun with politics, but we're going to take care of the state of West Virginia first. And I thought, well, that would be the same. I'm not seeing that, and I'm, I'm being as respectful as I can from the leadership from all across the board. Democrats and Republicans from the top, from the White House, all the way down on the House and on the Senate side. I haven't seen for the sake of the country we're going to do this. You're going to take a tough vote, John. Joe, you're going to take a tough vote, and this is going to help the country. And I haven't seen anybody... Well, that's where I wanted to get to, because there's that's, been... That bothers me. Uh, 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 I don't want to just pick on what the Republican leadership has been doing, but the Democratic leadership, Harry Reid, yeah. the, um, in, in terms of the lack of votes, right? I think C CQ came out the other day and found that there were 18 legislative votes. 18 it's, in it's, the entire... So, maybe it's wrong. Right. So how do you change well, that? Well, here's the thing. And, and, I, and John... And I, is he... And do you think that... And then we'll, we'll get we'll him talk, to answer yeah, about John, whether well, that, that changes under Republican the control. Thing. The Democrats right now in the Senate are believing that no matter what we do, you know, that, you know with the intentions uh, from the leader of the Republican Party is that we're going to destroy this president. Our main objection is to get rid of him. So they think everything they do is premised on that, okay? Right, wrong, or indifferent, forget about that. That was said two, three, four years ago. But if their intention is to filibuster everything, then we ought to at least give them the right to do that. If we, as senators, we ought to have, we have, the, we have earned the right to make a fool of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> we have. So if I'm saying John's going to do these things, let's give John a chance to filibuster all night long if he wants to and let the American public. On the other hand, I said, Harry, it's easier for me to go home and explain what I voted for than why I didn't vote at all or what I voted against. So, Harry, keep us there 24-7. Let's vote. Let's wear each other out. We, let's let the process work. Let's vote on the Keystone Pipeline. Let's vote on things. Whether you like them or not, I can at least explain that, and then John can tell about it. All right. So is this, would this, do you think this is what a Republican-controlled yeah. Senate would look like, that if Pat Toomey says, you know what, I know that this is not the agenda necessarily of the Republican leadership, but I want to put an amendment out there. I know I have Democrats to support it. I'd like to see that amendment. You think that that if would happen? We need regular order. We need to return. Barbara Mikulski passed many appropriations yeah. bills out of the Appropriations the committee. committee. Harry Reid did not allow a vote on one of those on the floor of the United States Senate. There have been over 2,000 amendments introduced in the last year, about 1,000 from Democrats, 1,000 from Republicans. There have been 20 votes. You talk about Mark Begich in Alaska. He's yeah. been in the Senate yeah. six years. He has never in six years had a roll call vote on an amendment with his name on it on the floor of the United States Senate. No senator elected in, Democrat senator elected in 2012, two years ago, none nothing. of them. Elizabeth Warren has not had a single vote on a single amendment on the floor of the United States Senate with her name on it. So these are senators who've offered hundreds and hundreds of amendments, and Harry Reid says no. I think it was the Hill, a roll call yesterday, said he has tied the, the Senate in, in knots to protect his members from having to take any votes on anything of substance. And so when the president comes out and says, it is my policies that are on the ballot and they vote with right. me 98 or 97 or 99 percent of the time, that to me makes this a referendum much more on the president and his policies and the fact that nothing gets done with a Democrat-controlled Senate, which is why I've had the editorial that says it's time to put the Republicans in charge back to regular order where we'll actually have votes on amendments, up or down, and deal with budgetary issues, appropriations, and even nominations. You had the Secretary of Commerce out here a few minutes ago. She got confirmed 98 to 1. Sylvia Burwell, they said, oh, they can never get a Health and Human Service oh, yeah, nominee no again. Problem. Well, she was from West Virginia, capable, <laughs> confident, Very good. and competent. All of those three knew what she was doing. Over, what, 80, 80 votes. Yeah, yeah. So there is bipartisan support for mainstream people. As Penny said, doesn't matter who's the, they have one agenda for the country. Get some trade going. Harry Reid after the State of the Union when the President now five years in a row said we need trade. The next day Harry Reid said, oh, not in this Senate, you're not. 
So there are things where the but president the, and the Republicans want to work is, together. Is it, real quickly, basically, as a parent, you take care of your children in their adolescent age. They become a teenager, they start finding their own identity, they begin college, they start... They're 30 or 40 years old now. Let them make some decisions. They're going to make them. All right. Let's so, so Harry yeah, Reid as helicopter parent is really what you're saying. Yeah, Harry is a doting <laughs> parent. Let, let, me, let, me, let me just say, to be, to be very fair to Harry yes. Reid, I will tell you Harry Reid would accept the following deal in a second. Which? Vote up or down majority on anything in the Senate. Vote up or down majority vote on anything in the House. In the House, we've not had a vote on the minimum wage increase. We've not had a vote on the immigration reform bill. We haven't had a vote on equal pay for equal work. We haven't had a vote on lots of things that the American public overwhelmingly supports. Majority vote in the Senate. The majority wins. Majority vote in the House. Even on Harry bills Reid would accept that agreement. You think even on bills that would embarrass the White House? He would do whether well, it was something it, on Obamacare, it, whether it was something on the Keystone Pipeline. We 53 times on Obamacare. You know, the, pre, the, the way the president could obviously veto that bill. Right. And then, and then the question is... Okay, but is would, he, would he allow, do you think, that there would be a, a bill allowed that would embarrass the White House, that Democrats would vote for, that would get a majority I, I think he would accept the deal I just talked about, okay. which is Speaker Boehner agrees to majority votes in the House. Majority votes in the Senate. So, well, part of this is the way the Constitution was written, the history of the right. country. The right. Senate was set in a way with 60 vote threshold so that the people asked to vote in the Senate do so for proposals that need bipartisan support to keep things getting done in the things that mainstream America would look for, not things on one extreme or the other, which is why for treaties you need 67 votes, why you need right. 60. The idea of nominations was supposed to be three-fifths right. so that you got nominees like the Secretary More of Commerce, centered, like yeah. uh, Let me tell you, so Senator, you, you just made a perfect a argument. And you just we haven't made, had a vote yet but, but on the <laughs> Surgeon General who was nominated 13 <laughs> but, months ago during the Ebola crisis. We don't have a Surgeon General because even with 55 Democrats in the Senate, but, Harry Reid can't get 51 but, because but, this nominee is so off the mainstream and so wrong but, for the but, job. <laughs> Senator, you, must, you just made the best argument why the House should vote on every bill that comes out of the Senate. Because the bills that come out of the Senate, as you say, they have to get that supermajority right. vote. Whereas the bills you mentioned in the House, yes, you had some Democrats, but we don't have that supermajority requirement, and so they don't meet that same test. So the immigration reform is Exhibit A. It met all the tests you just said, and Speaker Boehner won't let it come to a vote. So because of the differences between the Senate and the House, which you described, there's no excuse not to have a vote in the House on bills that pass the Senate. Okay, we need, 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 need to have and no I know we, to I, the I, I know we can go back and forth, but let me just say to, to the... Look. Yeah, look, can, we, can we end with right. one positive thing? Because we're, we're, our time is up. So <laughs> if we're, we can leave with... Guys, that's what I was going to say, that for all those people who say this election doesn't matter, I feel frustrated, Washington is broken, can you give us some optimism, whether it's from the state, whether it's from anywhere, just very quickly, anyone wants to stand up and say, this is why I'm glad that I'm in Congress, this is why everybody should vote. I think the most underreported story around health care, the most overreported story, of course, the, of course, the Affordable uh, Care Act, the most underreported story is the incredible progress being made in states across the country to transform the way that we deliver and pay for health care, moving away from the fee-for-service model. Uh, and I just, I think that the, the implications are going to be profound, and I, and I think in the end, in terms of what really matters to people, you know, in their home communities, or is that work? And I think it's incredibly positive. And there are lots of you know, states are laboratories of democracy, lots of different experiments going on in states across the country. We're going to learn from each other. And we don't care, by the way, if the good idea is, a democratic, is from a Democratic governor or a Republican governor. All we care about is what works. Okay. We're, still the, we're still the hope of the world. We're the, only country, we're the only country that can fix what's wrong in a democracy, and we've got to start working together, and we can do that. My dad was in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, had to quit school in ninth grade because of the Depression. From the time I was a little kid, he'd always say, John, you should thank God every day you live in America. That's right. You don't know how fortunate you are. All right, see, we are there so we go. Amen. There we go. Amen. Thank you, guys. Well done. Thank you all.